Uh, before I introduce our leader, our brother Leo Gerard, I just want to remind everybody, Leo's going to introduce Mike. After that, we need to stay around, we need to pay, an att pay attention, because John Hillier is going to come up and explain what our message is going to be. Everybody needs to go out there with the same message. So, it's my great honor to introduce my brother, my friend, and most important, steelworker leader, Leo Gerard. Leo. Leo has spent his entire life standing up for working families. Leo works ungodly hours. I don't know when he stops. I know when he gets up because the emails start coming, so I do know that part of it. <laughs> to get him out late at night. Leo has been out there, not only leading our union, but being a spokesperson for working families in America. He's been out there talking about, you want to have a good economy, you have to have manufacturing, you got to keep the manufacturers here, you got to find a way to bring manufacturing from overseas back into the United States. He doesn't only talk about that. He's down in Washington meeting with the president on his commission down there when they're talking about new manufacturing. He's saying all manufacturing is new manufacturing. He's very important down in D.C. for us. We're the union out there fighting every single day over bad trade agreements. Leo Gerard's down in Washington testifying before the International Trade Commission on a regular basis. We're out there following the trade cases. We're out there pointing out that it's wrong. It's wrong to give companies incentives to move jobs overseas. Let's find a way to incentivize them, the way to bring them back to the United States. And Leo has been outspoken, a person out there, about Buy American in the United States and what that means. When they're doing these infrastructure projects and they're using Chinese steel from Chinese-owned companies and other foreign companies, instead of using American steel, American products, that really boost the economy. That's where the economy comes from, making things. That's where it all starts. That's where the tax base comes from. Leo also is instrumental in the global labor movement. Leo had the foresight to know that we cannot compete with these multinational corporations just trying to deal with them in the United States and Canada. Leo helped us move into a transatlantic union, a, a coalition between us, a partnership. We unite the union, Workers United, and he also helped us formulate industrial and in, a global union from all over the world, which helps us battle multinational corporations. Leo has done everything anybody ever asked for him to do. He's been down there in Washington. He's been on picket lines anywhere he needs to be. He's really a polarizing voice for the labor movement. And I want to introduce my good friend, Leo Gerard. Part of me that simply wants to say, I'm going to save you a lot of time. I agree with everything Shelley said because she said everything I wanted to say and then just move on. But let, let me just uh, say on a very personal level, I have the honor and the privilege of representing our members. And I spend a lot of time, as John said, in Washington. And I can say this without fear. There has not been one member of the House of Representatives who has been as tough, as dedicated, as committed, as willing to stand up, as willing to do whatever is asked of them to benefit working people, particularly the people of Maine, but working people from everywhere, than Mike Michaud. I do get a little twinge in my stomach because I've originally got French Canadian roots. When I see Paul LePage pretending that he's got French Canadian former blood, seems to me like it's more like vampire blood coming around Halloween time. 
But I do also want to say that we're losing in the global fight about jobs because we've got too many Republicans that don't give a damn about jobs, too many governors that don't give a damn about jobs, and in particular I want to raise one issue that Mike has been a strong voice on. Last winter, gas coming to New England to run our homes and run our factories went up to almost $70 per MMBTU, for what that's a technical term, in New England. And because of that, we had to have some of our paper mills closed temporarily, that eventually ended up closing permanently. We had homes that didn't get heat for the winter in certain days because there wasn't enough gas. The New England governors called a conference for a day and a half or two days to talk about energy in New England. All the governors showed up but one. Turned the page on LePage, didn't show up. <laughs> he didn't show up for some reason that he thought that maybe at some point in the future he'll negotiate a cheaper energy deal with the province of Quebec. Let me tell you something, in Canada, you ain't getting anything cheap from the province of Quebec, even if you're a damn Canadian. <laughs> so I don't know what he's been smoking. <laughs> But I know one guy, I know one guy who's been worried about that. I know one guy that wanted to do something about that was Mike Michaud. I know that it's one guy. I know that it's one guy in this race that when he becomes the governor will want to call an energy conference. I know it's one guy that's going to demand that we get more natural gas in New England so we don't have to shut down our factories in the winter or give people downtime at their home for a few hours where they can't get gas to eat their home. And I know that that one guy will fight that the price gets equalized. So it's not $70 or $17 when they're paying $350 down in Louisiana for the same gas. Yeah. Those are important issues. And I think LePage doesn't talk about him because he's not qualified to talk about him. He doesn't give a damn about it and he couldn't articulate it with language that's way worse than the language I usually use. <laughs> I can't for the life of me, I can't for the life of me figure out why, why would any person who is the governor of a state Refuse, I think, five times? Five times refuse to let people have access to Medicaid. That ain't right. Seven zero thousand, seventy thousand Mainers are being denied access to Medicaid because he won't let it pass. What he's too stupid to understand is because they don't have access to Medicaid, means that by the time they get emergency health care, it's going to cost twice as much. Getting Medicaid for everybody is going to reduce costs to the state to be able to use that money for expansion, and that's probably why Maine now is ranked as the worst state in the union to do business. I'm not a pro-business guy. I'm a pro-jobs guy. And to have jobs, you've got to have companies. And to have companies, they've got to be given the opportunity to be able to know that they can make it. Am I going to put a plant here when I'm worried that I can't have enough gas in the winter to run it? No. no. These are simple things to figure out. We have an opportunity to make history. We have an opportunity to put an exclamation mark on the election process in 2014. And Shelley pointed it out. We have the opportunity not only to elect the grandson and the son, we have the opportunity to elect a mill worker to be governor of one of the most important states in the union. I don't know how many of you have had the privilege of being in Mike's office in Washington. You go in his office in Washington, one of the first things you'll notice is his lunch bucket. I think he ought to hide sandwiches in there from me when I go there. I, I gotta tell you, I ate four damn lobsters last night. They're attacking, they're attacking me from the inside. But 
I didn't eat four damn donuts. You don't respect me. <laughs> Look at to be very, very serious. We really have the opportunity in Maine to make a statement amongst all the craziness and stupidity that's going on in this country, all the fear-mongering, all the things that have been done to uh, try to denigrate the president. They'd want to denigrate the president because they want to denigrate what he's trying to do and what he's done. Unemployment is down below 6%. It would be a lot lower if teabag, tea party, extremist, Republican governors hadn't attacked public sector workers, hadn't attacked people's standard of living, hadn't let cost of schools and state-owned schools rise through the roof. If they'd have done the kinds of things that need to be done to support a growing economy, we'd be a lot better off. We have this opportunity that will only be given to us very rarely, maybe for many of us once in a lifetime, to be in a state where you can have someone who started off as the grandson and son of a mill worker, worked in the mill on the line for 29 years, used his experience from that work to be a voice in his state house till he had the credibility to get things done that people thought could never get done, went to Congress and has been our voice in Congress, standing up for us sometimes when even many Democrats didn't have the courage to stand up for us. He stood with us, he carried our message, he walked across the aisle to some, he was the voice for the Berry Amendment. Without him it would have never stayed, it would never got passed. Without him, New Balance might not be here. Without him, we wouldn't have had a member in the Congress that was willing to lead the fight on trade issues. There was never a trade case that came to the ITC, the National Trade Commission, where if we asked Mike to testify, he didn't show up on time and testify. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for labor to knock on every door, to do everything that we can do to elect a governor that knows what it's like to have walked in our shoes because he still walks in our shoes. He still walks the walk, he still talks the talk, and he never forgot where he came from. And the easiest thing... You know, the easiest thing is to do nothing. But it becomes the hardest thing to change. After you've done nothing, what comes that needs to be changed becomes even harder. This is our chance. This is our time. And when Mike is elected governor on Tuesday, the pundits will know that no matter what happened in the rest of the country, Maine elected a mill worker to be governor. Mike Pico. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Gerard, for that very kind and very generous and, and warm introduction. But I also want to thank you as well. You have been a dynamic leader for the United Steelworkers Union for many, many years. And there hasn't been one moment when some labor groups were getting a little soft on some of these trade deals that I didn't pick up the phone and call Leo, say, Leo, I need your help. We got some soft brothers and sisters. We need you to firm them up. He was always there fighting for what's right for the workers in this country. And for Congresswoman Pingree and uh, Mayor Brennan and everyone else, I want to thank you as well. And Mayor Brennan, I wanted to let you know, as, as your governor, we won't have to have municipalities increasing the minimum wage by municipal level. We'll be doing that at the state level as well. So.
for my brothers and sisters um, at Fairpoint. I want to thank you for what you're doing. I know you're in a big battle now with Fairpoint because they are not at the table negotiating fairly. And I can assure you, after Tuesday's election, I'll be doing everything I can, if I'm successful in winning this election, to bring Fairpoint to the bargaining table to negotiate a fair trade deal for our brothers and sisters. And for the Columbia University students who are here today as well, this election is just about, about your future as well. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming up here as well. I think you're going to have an enjoyable time over the next uh, a few days here in the state of Maine. But this election is about our future generation. And what I've seen this governor do over his four years as governor has decimated our education system here in the state of Maine, has decimated the values that we hold near and dear uh, to our to Maine values as far as making sure that everyone has an opportunity to move themselves into the middle class. So I want to thank the students here as well for all the children. And for brothers and sisters, it's great to be here. Uh, as some of you know, it's a very difficult decision for me to make to come back and run for governor. Because I really do love what I'm doing in Washington. Uh, whether it's fighting for our veterans, fighting for uh, transportation infrastructure, uh, funding, fighting for fair trade deals. Uh, it was a tough decision. But my love for the state of Maine is more than holding on to a safe seat in Congress. Because I know, as governor, you can do a lot of good things here in the state of Maine. We can set the direction here in Maine with having a governor who understands what working men and women are going through. Having a governor who's willing to put forward policies that lifts everyone up. We can be a leader here in the state of Maine, focusing on working family values issues, and everyone can rise up here in Maine as well. We have so much work to do to see what this governor has done. As I go around the state, my hometown, East Millinocket, I've seen the mill still shut down, uh, the Lincoln Lane off a couple hundred employees, uh, the Old Town Mill, the Bucksport Mill. And it's amazing that someone who's supposed to be a pro-business governor hasn't brought in the industry to talk to the industry about what we need to do to make sure that we're competitive against these unfair trade deals. Instead, what has Governor LePage done? Nothing. 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 But he's also sent a letter encouraging the trade deals that we fought, the Panama, the Columbia, and the South Korea trade deal. This governor supported it. He sent a letter in support of those trade deals without really knowing what effect that they'll have on us here in this country. This governor never lifted a finger. We saw what was happening in the Port Hawkesbury Mill in Nova Scotia with those unfair subsidies that directly affects mills here in the state of Maine. He was absent. He was also absent, as the president mentioned, when they had a two-day energy conference with other New England governors. And actually, what he said was in one of the debates, well, he'll wait until we have Republican governors in New England. Well. You know, that's, that's a lack of leadership. That's no leadership. You know, as governor, I don't care if it's a Republican governor or a Democratic governor, I'm going to be at the bargaining table when it comes to energy issues here in New England and making sure that other New England governments understand how important they are for us here in the state of Maine. Likewise, when you look at health care, as the President Gerard mentioned, this governor vetoed not once but five times the expansion under the Affordable Care Act. That veto, those vetoes, is hurting the state of Maine. And I know some of you called, actually President Gerard called me up when we were dealing with the Affordable Care Act in Congress, I don't know if I was going to support it, and I said, well, I can't support it now because it doesn't take care of Maine. 
and I explained why it did not take care of Maine because of the enhanced reimbursement rate. And a, bu a bunch of us held out until we were able to actually get an enhanced reimbursement rate. And what this governor, by vetoing that bill, did, not only will it deny access to the 70,000 Mainers, but also Maine actually will save, will save over $600 million over a 10 year time by covering access to those 70,000 Mainers. Hospitals get an additional $348 million over that same time frame. And it's estimated that we'll actually create about 3,000 jobs here in the state of Maine. And get this, over a 10 year time frame, the amount of money the state of Maine will be able to bring in from the federal government is three billion dollars. It's a win-win all the way around, but this governor's ideology has prevented him from signing that bill. And the fact that we're covering 70,000 Mainers, for those of you who do have health care coverage, it actually will help hold down the cost because that cost shifting that occurs. So on day one, I'll be submitting legislation to the legislature to expand access to health care for those 70,000 Mainers. So there is a lot at stake, brothers and sisters, in this election. Not only in my race, but also for the control of the legislature, uh, the House and Senate, make sure we get Shelley Uri elected and Emily Kane and Shanna Ballas elected as well. But we can't do it alone. I need your help once again. I remember back over 12 years ago when I first decided to run uh, for Congress. At that point in time, a lot of people said, well, Mike, you know, why would you want to do it except for Bruce? Br Bruce, uh, uh, you know, was saying, you got to run for Congress, you got to run for Congress. Uh, but, uh, and back then, people said, well, you can't, you can't win. Because you live in the wrong part of the state. You're not a lawyer. You're not a millionaire. You don't have what it takes to win. And actually, I can remember because during that election, the Chamber of Commerce came out and said, well, you don't have to worry about Mike, because in Maine, labor is nothing but a paper tiger. They won't be able to elect one of their own. But on that election day, we did, because that so-called paper tiger was awoken. And it roared like a lion on election day, because each and every one of you did what you had to do to get me elected. And if you go back and look at the mill towns, what we were able to accomplish back then. Pretty much, I think the loss I received in the mill town was 86% of the vote. <laughs> and it's because of what you've done. And actually, in several of the mill towns, I received 94, 95, 96% of the vote in a six-way primary. <laughs> and it's because of the labor movement. Right. You was out there, you were going door to door, you were calling your membership up, you were calling your friends, friends and families up to do what you had to do to make sure that we had a labor member elected to Congress, someone who understands the working families issues, someone who will uh, wake up every day fighting for men and women here in the state of Maine, someone who's not afraid to talk to anyone, whether it's the President of the United States, Vice President, or our colleagues in Congress, to really fight for what's right. And that's what's we're up to this election. This governor has failed this state in so many different ways. He doesn't have our values. He doesn't care about working men and women. See him and, on my picket line. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably won't see him on your picket line either. But he met with a company. And, and that's something I want to assure each and every one of you. That as your governor, I'll wake up each and every morning putting forward policies to do what we have to do as a state to lift everyone up so that no one here in the state of Maine has to worry about where they're gonna put the next meal on the table. Lift them up into the middle class. That's the American dream. And all we have to do here in the state of Maine is make sure that we have a governor who believes 
and the workers here in the state of Maine. A governor who will fight for what's right for people here in the state of Maine. And a governor who's not afraid to sit across the table with CEOs from all across the country and to ask them and to tell them that I want you to negotiate a fair contract with your employees. So once again, brothers and sisters, thank you very much for your, uh, your support over the years. I look forward to working with you. I look forward to making sure that this election is a successful election. So thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you.